one and all, my name is John Clare, this is John Starcart, and as always, you are very welcome. Now, in today's video, I wanted to talk about the second in my Seven Deadly Sins series, and that is gluttony. Now, what I'll do, I'll bring up a few here now for you to have a look at, and as you can see, I chose a Wolverine. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, John, why did you choose a Wolverine? Well, let me just answer that question for you. Its scientific name is Gula Gula which literally translates from the original Latin to glutton glutton. Also, I just like Wolverines and think they're cool, so I decided to draw one. And this was the perfect excuse to do exactly that. So, what we'll do now is we'll go into the walkthrough. I'll talk about all my decisions in the creation of the piece, and we'll do that now. Okay, so now, here we are, we're in Procreate. And here's a Wolverine in question. So what I'm gonna do now, First and foremost, is I'm going to go into Canvas, Canvas Information. And if we go into Statistics, you can see that I've done a total of 11 hours and 46 minutes, and total strokes made are 2,455. Now, you may notice from the previous week's video in Pride that the time taken is about the same, but there was a lot more strokes, and I'll be able to explain why that is during the course of the drawing. So hit time lapse replay, and here we are. Curiosity is glutton to seize to devour, a quote by Victor Hugo. Now I look, again, like last week, bit of a confession. I don't actually know where Victor Hugo said that, or whether it was a spoken quote, or whether it was a quote from his writing. I'm not entirely sure, because I was just looking for quotes that were kind of that could be directly attributed to the concept that the drawing is embodying. So the idea would be to upload the time lapse, the quote would come up, and then you'd see the drawing elapse in the Instagram reels or whatever. So anyway, let's let that run now. And here I am roughing out the animal in question. It seems like I am, it seems like I'm like messing around quite a lot. Seems like there's an initial degree of uncertainty before I finally kind of get into it a little bit. And I think the good, I think you'll notice quite a lot with, if you watch a lot of other artists draw, what they tend to do is the focus is usually on the eyes. And this is for good reason, is because the eyes sometimes are the hardest parts to draw. Not necessarily in terms of their shape, but in terms of making them convincing. The thing is with eyes is that they are very expressive, especially in mammals and especially in humans. So for us to kind of, as artists, in order to kind of depict that, we, there is a lot of time usually spent on the eyes in order to kind of make them look and feel like they're alive more than anything else. And it's kind of an intangible thing, but a lot of it is funny enough due to the reflections. If you get the reflections right, more often than not, the animal then suddenly exudes, or the human being suddenly exudes personality. They're, they're, they're a lot more engaging. So anyway, I'm roughing it out as we go. I'm developing it with my usual scrappy, messy hatching style, which seems to work, especially when I'm drawing um, mammals, when I'm drawing very furry animals. My, my style of shading seems to suit it quite well. As long as I go in the direction that the fur is traveling in, it seems to work out more or less perfectly, I think. And again, what I'm doing here, a lot of it is like, you know, if we run back through it and run, run, run it forward, there's a lot of fine tuning going on. I'm adding bits, I'm taking bits away. Like I pointed out last week, just by using the same brush in the eraser as I do in the actual painting tool, it enables me to keep a consistency in the mark so it still looks natural. So, I finished the head and now I'm just basically mapping out the body. I mean, that this didn't take long at all. I mean, like, usually, the reason why I keep things very rough is because I know that they're gonna be, it's gonna be inexact. It's gonna be near enough to where I need it to be that once I kind of come back over and finalize it or hone it or develop it, that, you know, I'm already in a position where I'm more or less happy with things. So 
it makes the actual process of developing it a lot easier for me. So we just very easily move forward. Now I've kind of loosely sketched out where the back fur is going to be and then now I'm just kind of developing on top of it. And again, adding, subtracting, adding, subtracting. I mean, I'm still developing the head at this point as well. So there's still things I'm tweaking and tuning in order to kind of blend it in with the rest of the body. And that continuous development, allowing. So now I've kind of finished the back area, well, more or less finished it. I've started working on the rest of the body and kind of tweaking areas around there getting the feet and the toes put in, the claws put in. Because, I don't know if you know this, but not only do wolverines have a terrifying bite that can literally crunch through bone without any issue whatsoever, but they have massive claws. Also, in the initial reference, if I could bring it up for you here now, I will. The actual animal itself was actually coming out of water, which is obviously not what I wanted for this. So what I did was I, you know, I changed it to more, more suit my needs. And I added the tail in there for composition, for balance more than anything else. So I'm developing the claws and the paws, making them look hopefully as good as possible. And yeah, a little bit of finishing touches here. One second, so I finished I finish the foot here. Then I kind of reshaded and, re and adjusted the, um, the fur on the back there, as you can see. And that was it, that's it done. So what we'll do now is we'll start rounding this out. So let's do that now. Okay, so that was Gluttony. It's a drawing I'm pretty happy with. And yes, it will be up for sale on the website. So if you'd like to go over to www.johnsdarkart.com, uh, the drawing will be available in two print sizes. That will be A3 at 75 euros and A4 at 45 euros. So if you like what we do, you want to help support us, head over to www.johnsdarkart.com, pick yourself up a print. Be very much appreciated. Thank you very much. So, the actual subject matter itself, gluttony. Now, as I said earlier on, the reason why I selected the Wolverine is because its Latin name, its scientific name is Gula Gula, which is directly translated from the original Latin of glutton, glutton. And I think the reason for that was the animal itself is the largest of the mustelids, the weasels. So it's related to the likes of the honey badger, the European badger, the otters, and whatever else. It's the largest of that particular clade and it's a hardy little animal and it has to be because it's usually found in the Antarctic area so Canada North America you'll also find it in Russia Sweden um, Norway the Scandinavian countries in general it's a hardy animal in a very harsh environment so in order for it to sustain itself in such an environment a, it has to be ferocious uh, which it definitely is. I mean, this thing takes on bears and usually wins. But also, when it consumes food, whether it kills it or comes across it uh, as a carcass, it will overeat, it will chew through the bones, it will eat itself to the point where it can't move. And this is the reason why I think it was attributed that name of Gula Gula. Now, moving that concept of gluttony into us as a species now when this was initially written right when these these uh, seven deadly sins were first conceptualized back then if you were wealthy you were fat because you could afford to eat the best foods that were available whether you were landed gentry whether you were royalty whereas if you were a serf if you were the proto working class so to speak you'd be forced to eat whatever you could and that food wouldn't be very nutritious, wouldn't be very high in calories and you'd often be working bloody hard for not much. Now, in the 21st century, thanks to our advances in agriculture, in, in um, our animal husbandry, we are now at a point where we can produce 
very high calorie foods for very, very cheap. And it's come to the point now where it's fat people who are often the poorest and the wealthiest are often the fittest and the thinnest and the most attractive because they have the resources to be fit and thin and very attractive. Whereas a lot of the working class, not just those who ain't working, but those who are. Like if you're in a sedentary post, if you're working in an office or you're a long haulage driver or whatever, you'll find a lot of these people tend to be very overweight. Why? Because they tend to eat very high calorie foods. Um, they don't tend to move around very much in order to burn off those calories. And then more often than not, they end up being overweight. Now, this isn't a judgment call on my part. This is just as things stand in the Western world, and whether it be North America, whether that be Europe, Australia, anywhere that could be considered Western. And I think the more accurate term should be industrialized because we are so good at industrializing our food output to the point where we can, well, as long as you have the resources, eat anything from anywhere around the world. Yeah, we're in a strange dichotomy where it's the poorest who are the heaviest among us and the, the richest who are the thinnest. But also, that doesn't just translate to food and overconsumption of food or overconsumption of calories, you know, whether that because our dumb monkey brains are still thinking in terms of us being hunter gatherers. You know, we tend to go for foods that are incredibly sweet, very fattening, taste really good. And as a result, because of the commodification of the food of the food industry, we're in a state now where we can get really high calorie foods for very cheap and end up being very overweight. I mean, I, I'm one to talk, I'm pretty hefty myself at the moment. But it isn't just food though, is it? You know, it's other, other problems as well, whether it's the clothes that we wear. They're often designed to be very quickly worn through. Now, a good example is I recently, a couple of years ago, bought a really nice pair of Timberland boots. And technically, there's nothing wrong with them except the soles are worn through. Once upon a time, you could have gone to a cobbler and got those boots resold. Now, if I was to take those boots to a cobbler, they'd turn me away because the, the soles are designed to work, be worn through. So then what do you do? You end up going out and buying another pair of Timberlands. That's all by design. The same could be said of our modern day electronics. Once upon a time, if you bought a TV, that thing would last you 20, 25, 30 years. If you bought a washing machine, it would last you for years. You may need to replace parts here and there, but then what of it? It's cheap to repair, there's plenty of parts. But the problem with that though, is companies like Apple, like Hotpoint, like Samsung, they don't like that. They'd rather you just buy the entire thing. So it could be like with, for instance, the technology that I'm using, that we're using to produce this very um, this very program. The cameras that we use, the laptops, they're designed in mind to be eventually obsolescent. They slow down, they become over encumbered over time thanks to software bloat, thanks to added features. And what that ends up doing, it slows your item down, whether it's my iPad, whether it's my laptop, to the point where it becomes slow, so slow and sluggish that you feel to yourself, oh damn it, I need to upgrade. And you go out and you spend an exorbitant amount of money on new goods. And that isn't just attributable to Apple, that can be Microsoft laptops, that can be Lenovo laptops, that can be whatever. I mean, okay, the prices by comparison may be more expensive if you buy Apple, but generally speaking, you're still investing a huge amount of money on technology that will eventually become obsolete. Same applies to our modern day TVs. Like I said earlier on, a TV bought back in the 80s would still be working now. But a TV bought, uh, made now won't be working in five years because there'll be some other new feature, whether it goes from high def to 4K, from 4K to 8K or whatever is the new standard that we must, def uh, we must follow in order to get the best possible picture quality. And also these items like TVs, for instance, are often in terms of a financial sense, very cheap. You buy one on Amazon that's only a year or two old for a couple of hundred euro. But the problem is in terms of the amount of resources that are needed to buy, to produce new goods, 
whether it be plastics, whether it be rare earth metals, I mean, even common materials like lithium, like iron or whatever else, we we use so much of this and the amount of energy that's needed. So the amount of oil and coal and um, natural gas that we burn through in order to produce these goods, it's incredibly wasteful and incredibly gluttonous. Also, you've got to bear in mind that how gluttony, not just that can be attributed to what we consume physically, but what we consume in terms of our media. Like, go on Netflix. How often do you spend just looking through Netflix, figuring out what you want to watch, and then binging? Binging. A term that was once attributed to overeating. I binge eat, or you go out on the you go out on the tear and you binge drink too much alcohol. Now you're binging TV. Your time is being monopolized because you sit down and you watch Netflix for hours, you watch YouTube for hours, you doom scroll through TikTok or Instagram. And how those then have a deleterious effect on the psychology of of us as a species, whether it's young girls being subjected to images that are completely unattainable for them and creating eating disorders and psychological disorders, or for young men who are you know whether it be through certain figures on the internet who I shall remain who I shall not mention but how certain figures can distort their view on the world and and how it can distort their views on the opposite sex all this binging all this overconsumption of content you know some of it is useful and educational i use youtube all the time if i don't know how to edit something or there's something to procreate I'm not familiar with that I need to go and do a bit of research on it it's an amazing resource but at the same time there's a lot of just empty shite on there and the same applies for Instagram I use Instagram to see other artists and what they're doing and to help promote my own art but also at the same time there's just a lot of shite on there a lot of nonsense but Um, I found myself at times, whether it be on YouTube Reels, whether it be on TikTok, or whether it be on Instagram, just flicking through, and flicking through, and flicking through. And now I'm a man in my 40s, never mind like what youngsters, what young teenagers who haven't got fully formed brains, you know, how, how that's affecting them. I think gluttony isn't just about overeating, it's about how we, how we take more than we need to the point of excess, to the point of being wasteful. Like, for instance, wasteful food, like you have a massive plate of food in front of you, you don't eat three quarters of it, there's a load of it left over, it just gets thrown straight in the bin. Like how technology, whether it be, say for instance, vapes. Now, I vape, I'm not proud of it, but I do. The reason why is because I thought, you know, I wanted to get off cigarettes. So I went from cigarettes to vaping, but the problem is now, if you go into a shop, you can pick up a disposable vape. So it's not just the contents of the liquid, it is the entire container, the battery, the lights, the packaging. That in itself is incredibly wasteful and you, you can walk around any city on a Friday, Saturday night and you'll see them strewn all over the floor. Incredibly wasteful, you know. I think society as a whole, and we're all, And I'm not pontificating here because I'm part of the same society you watching this are a part of. And we are all responsible for what we're doing, both as a society, but also how corporations are encouraging us through advertising and marketing. You know, it is this kind of deleterious aspect of our society that I think is bringing us all down because not only does it affect the individual, whether it be through overeating or overconsumption or of um, materials or content, but also how it affects the environment because the resources that we're tearing up, the rainforests that we're hacking down, the rivers and oceans that we're polluting, you know, the resources like oil, natural gas and coal that we're just digging out of the ground. It's something that as a society we need to really get a grip on and get some degree of understanding on and I think the understanding is there but the political will isn't there the financial will isn't there a company like Apple the richest company in the world who I'm using their gear here and here you know I'm contributing to Apple's wealth by purchasing their goods but 
you know, what motivation does a company have when it's their entire modus operandi is to generate wealth for their stakeholders and they're governed by three quarterly cycles of sharing their profits to the to the um, stock market. There's, there's no room for the long view. I mean, if you go to Barcelona, you see the Sagrada Familia, this beautiful church that still isn't finished, that's been under construction for 120 years. There's a cathedral in Cologne in Germany that took 600 years to build. We're not thinking like that as a species anymore. We're thinking so short term, within the span of our own lifetimes. We're not thinking about the world that we're leaving behind for the next generation to come through. We are in a position now, whether it be in terms of the environment, whether it be in terms of our societies, that, you know, we do need to give some serious thought into what we're doing and how our overconsumption, how our gluttony is affecting not just us here and now, but for those that come after us. It's something that we do need to th figure out and we need to talk about, not shout about, not roar and shout and debate and be hostile over. It's something that we need to do as a species collectively. We need to think about what it is that we're doing. We need to discuss what we're doing and put plans into action. Are we doing it? Maybe, but if we are, we're doing a pretty piss poor job. But I don't know. I mean, look, I don't have the answers and I'm not gonna proclaim I do. But there are things that we can all do as individuals that could definitely help that cutting down our food waste reducing the amount of you know food that we buy if you're going to buy a laptop or a tablet or a phone keep hold of it for a longer and get as much use out of it as you can like i've had this ipad for five years i've had this laptop for two and i intend to have it for a few more years yet until it stops being useful to me my camera that i'm recording this on now well both mine and roman's cameras they're five years old you know so it's a case of trying to make use of what we have got and be mindful of what we are consuming but we need to start figuring it out and again like i said it can't be done through shouting it can't be done through finger pointing it can't be done through de aggressive debate it has to be done through conversation that is open-hearted and and where parties are willing to compromise for the greater good and hopefully at some point we'll be able to do that but I have my concerns and I have my worries that we'll be, we'll, we'll be able to do it in time. Time will come. Anyway, my name has been John Clow. This has been John's Dark Heart. And as always, you have been very welcome. <laughs>